of all the different things in our lives that, that, that weigh us down, I, at least as Christians, I think perhaps nothing is more confusing, nothing is, is more frustrating even than hearing nothing but silence from God. You know, where a, a, a godly mother prays for her wayward son. He was, he was raised up in the church. He went to Sunday school. He knows the Bible. Yet, when he left home, he left it all behind. And for so many years, this mother has prayed for him. But to this day, he remains a, a prodigal son. Or how about the, the wife? She's been praying for her husband who, who left her after 23 years of marriage for a younger woman. And he seems utterly unreachable. And the marriage heads swiftly towards divorce. Or how about the, the husband who prays desperately for his wife who they found out has terminal cancer. She has six, maybe seven months to live. None of the treatments are stopping the rampaging tumors and, and the elders have come and they've anointed her with oil and they've prayed over her in the name of the Lord, yet five months later, she's gone. Or how about the, the young man who, who prays for deliverance from an overpowering temptation in his life, but the, that, that struggle just never seems to end. And the more he prays, the, the worse that temptation seems to become. And so we cry out with the psalmist, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why, O Lord, do you hide yourselves, yourself in my time of trouble? We see that in Psalm 10.1. And as we think about that very question, we will be helped if we will simply acknowledge this reality. There are a great many believers who struggle with the issue of unanswered prayer. I mean, if there's a God, if he really does answer prayer, why doesn't he answer my prayer? Right? Now, you wouldn't think such a serious subject would make it into a comic strip, would you? But it does, and I happen to find it in a comic strip, my personal favorite of all comics in all of the history of the whole wide world. It's not even close. My absolute favorite comic strip is Calvin and Hobbes. I love Calvin and Hobbes. Bill Watterson, genius. So we're going to throw it up on the screen so you can see it. Now, it's, it's a late November... And you may not be able to read the words, so I'm going to work my way through this here. It's a late November, and little boy Calvin, he's waiting with his sled for the very first big snowfall, right? And he waits, and he waits. But all he finds is brown grass and no snow. So he says, if I was in charge, we'd never see grass between October and May. And then he looks up to the heavens and he says, on three, ready? One, two, three, snow. Right? You see it there in the purple letters? And nothing happens. Nothing happens and the little boy's frustrated. So then he shouts to the heaven, I said snow. Come on, snow. And then he shakes his fists and he cries, snow right? Now, at this point, thoroughly disgusted with God's failure, he says, okay, then don't snow. See if I care. I like this weather. Let's have it forever. But Calvin's defiance doesn't last long. In the next frame, we see a little boy on his knees. He's offering prayer. And he says, please snow, please, right? Just a foot. Okay, eight inches. That's all. Come on. Six inches. How about just six? And then he looks to the heavens and he says, I'm waiting. And in the next frame, you see it there in the red lettering. 
In the next frame, you see him running around in a circle, his head's down, his fists are crenched, me- f- clenched. He's making those little boy sounds with which the artist spells out as, Arr! right? That's not a proper English word, but if you've been around little boys, you've heard that word before. Finally, poor little Calvin is exhausted. His energy is spent. His prayer is unanswered. And with snow nowhere in sight, in the very final frame, he looks up at God and he cries out in utter desperation, Do you want me to become an atheist? Right? We laugh, but many, many Christians feel just like that little boy. Only they've prayed for things that were much more important than a couple of inches of snow. But the end result was still the same. And in their frustration and, and in, their, in their despair, they've cried out to God, do you want me to become an atheist? And some of them have. Most haven't. But many keep that pain inside, still believing as best as they can in a, in a God who sometimes answers prayer and sometimes doesn't, right? I've been helped by one great discovery in this, in my own faith walk. Folks, I'm not the first person to ever have had my prayers go unanswered. And in fact, Not only have my prayers not gone unanswered, but the Bible is filled with stories of men and women who prayed to God in moments of crisis even, and God, for some reason, sometimes explained, sometimes not, didn't answer those prayers. We don't hear much about that because our focus is naturally on all the great answers that that come in the Bible just in the nick of time, right? Right? I mean, most of us would rather hear about the parting of the Red Sea than about Trophimus being sick at Miletus. You remember that story, right? All the Sunday school lessons that went on that? Sure you don't. Miracles that did happen are more encouraging than stories of miracles that almost happened. Right? Right? And as I, as, as I flip through the, the pages of my Bible, I find no story of unanswered prayer that encourages me more, frankly, than the account of the Apostle Paul's unanswered prayer in 2 Corinthians 12. And that's where we're going to hang out today. And in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul reveals to us that 14 years earlier, that he had been caught up to heaven and he, Paul, had seen things that no other mortal man had ever seen before. A special anointing and blessing by God. It was the greatest experience of his entire life and he never forgot what it was like. But when that great experience was all over, something else happened to Paul that would change his whole perspective on life. Let's let Paul tell that story in his own words. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says this. Paul writes, to keep, or in order that, to keep from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me in my flesh a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, Bible students are, are, are divided about what this verse really means. Some, some would argue that the thorn in the flesh was, was simply the fierce opposition that Paul was getting at that point from his Jewish opponents. Others have suggested over time that this thorn in the flesh was some kind of demonic oppression. Still others, and I think the majority, and I would agree with this thought probably, Still others will think that this thorn in Paul's flesh was some sort of a a physical ailment that crippled Paul in some way and limited his effectiveness. And in one sense, 
it, it really doesn't matter all that much what it actually was. The crucial point is that Paul prayed to God to remove the thorn in his flesh so that he could get on with ministry, right? And in fact, he prayed not once, but he prayed three different times. And each and every time, what did God say? No. No. Paul, your prayer is going unanswered. Verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, says Paul. Can you imagine that? The Apostle Paul, probably the, the, the greatest Christian who has ever lived, the man who in, introduced Christianity to Europe, the man who wrote much of the New Testament, right? The man who prayed about this need in his life found that God did not, would not answer his prayer. It's hard to believe that, isn't it, almost? Because we know Paul was a man of prayer. In every single letter he writes that we read, he talks about prayer. I mean, imagine, Paul comes walking in today, right? The Apostle Paul in his robes and everything comes walking down the aisle while I'm preaching. And Paul says, you know, I'd be glad to pray for any of you. What would we do? We'd all line up as fast as we could. I'd stop preaching to get in that line. To have Paul pray for me? We'd get in that line and I'd be like, hey, Paul, pray for this. Man, to have Paul pray for me? Wow. But here's a clear-cut case given in Paul's own words of a time where he desperately begged God over and over again for a very specific prayer. And yet God said no. As I, as I think of this story, I, I gather great encouragement from it, actually. And it teaches us several important principles. You see, in Paul's case, what did Paul do? He kept on praying until God finally gave him an explanation. We see this in verse 9. But God said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, it is made perfect in weakness. You see, sometimes our, our prayers are not answered because God can do more through us by not answering our prayers than he can do through answering them. You see, sometimes God's no is actually better than God's yes. Think of it this way. What would happen if God answered all of your prayers all of the time in the exact manner in which you prayed them? Right? I mean, forget for a moment that some of your prayers are probably foolish, right? Some of your prayers are undoubtedly short-sighted. Just suppose that God answered each and every one of them. If God answered all your prayers, would that produce spiritual maturity in your life? If God was your magic genie in the sky and all you had to do was wish for something and you got it, would you have any spiritual maturity? I think not. If God always answered your prayers, eventually your trust would be in the answers, not in the Lord alone. But when God says no, we are forced then to decide whether or not we will still trust in God alone without the benefit of an answered prayer to lean upon. I mean, don't get me wrong here. Answered prayer is wonderful. And if none of our prayers were ever answered, the likelihood is we'd just all stop praying altogether, wouldn't we? But if all of our prayers were answered, we'd end up taking God for granted. Unanswered prayers force us to trust God alone. And when we do, he gets all the glory. For it is at that point that his strength is made perfect in our weakness, says Paul. This is exactly what Paul is saying. 
And it's the testimony of Christians across the centuries. We, as hard as it may be, both to hear and experience, we grow best in the darkness of pain and sadness and despair. Sounds kind of weird to hear it out loud, but we do. We learn many things in the sunlight, yes, but we grow best, actually, in the dark times. You want to learn to trust God? Suffer. Suffer. Real encouraging, Pastor, thanks. But you want to learn to trust God? Suffer a little bit. You'll learn in abundance. Learn to trust God despite not getting your way. Because that is when you will grow by leaps and bounds spiritually. Sometimes it's better for us if our prayers aren't answered immediately, frankly. Sometimes it's better if they're not answered at all. And, and the great question isn't, how can I get my prayers answered? That's not the good question. The great question is, what will it take for me to draw near to God? Consider these words here. These are attributed to a, a Civil War soldier who died in battle. And it was found in a notebook on the field. And the man wrote, it says, I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men, yet I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for but everything I hoped for. Almost despite myself, he writes, my, un my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among men most richly blessed. It's great advice in spiritual understanding to be able to say, I got nothing I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. And that brings me to my big idea for the day today. And that big idea is very simple. Sometimes, sometimes our prayers will go unanswered. And unless you admit that fact and deal with it as a Christian, you'll probably give up on prayer altogether. And to make matters worse, sometimes our prayers offered from righteous motives are prayers that come from our pure heart they still seem to accomplish nothing, don't they? But that's not true. Because you see, as we are told in Scripture, God does indeed hear our every prayer, even the ones that he chooses not to answer. No prayer is entirely wasted, for even, even an unanswered prayer can be used by God to help us draw closer to him. And in that case, we... We may say that it was better for our prayers to go unanswered that we might draw near to God. And so the, the final solution, I think, lies somewhere along these lines. It's this, that when we pray, when we pray, we kind of tend to focus on the answers, don't we? But you see, God doesn't want us to focus on the answers. God wants us to focus on him. And whatever will actually help us do that is really what it is that we need. Sometimes that means our prayers will be answered in, in amazing, abundant, and miraculous ways. And at other times, our prayers won't be answered at all. You remember this at all from the, from the experience of Job, right? Talked about him six or seven weeks ago, in fact. See, Job, Job had it all, right? 
and he lost his home, he lost his fortune, he lost his children, he lost his health, he lost his reputation. Everything that he counted dear in this world was taken away from him. And when he had finally hit rock bottom, when he was filled with anger, when he was wishing that he was dead, he utters these words of faith. Though he, though God, slay me, yet I will still trust in him. Job thirteen fifteen. It's as if he's saying to God, God, you can take my life, but you can't stop me from trusting in you. There's kind of a note of a, of a belligerent defiance in those words. And yes, if you read the book of Job, Job was not happy about what God had allowed to be done to him. And yes, Job wanted his day in court. He wanted answers for what was going on. But underneath all of his anger and the searing pain that he was experiencing was a bedrock faith in God. I don't understand this all. But I'm hanging on to you, Lord. And God, I'm not going to let go. That's the place to which God wants to bring us. And sometimes it's only through unanswered prayer that we get there. Now having said all of that, we still need to know how to respond when we pray and God doesn't answer us. What do we do? Well, I have three suggestions for you today. The first suggestion is this. Keep on praying as long as you can. Sometimes God's answers are delayed for reasons beyond our, our knowledge, beyond our understanding. And, and, and from time to time you hear those types of stories, right? People who've prayed for loved ones for 20, 30, 40 years that they would repent and, and, and turn back to the Lord, right? And we all know probably of stories where, where the doctor came in and gave a diagnosis and said, the end is near. And yet... Miraculous recoveries happen. We've heard those stories, right? So keep on praying as long as you can. The second thing we need to do, and this one's tough, but the second thing we need to learn to do, give God the right to say no. I mean, in the ultimate sense, God already has that right. He doesn't need our permission whether you acknowledge it or not, God can say no. But if you would never acknowledge that God has the right to say no, you're going to find yourself filled with anger, filled with frustration, filled with despair. You see, to fight against God's right to say no is really the same thing as fighting against God. And, and I tell you what, fighting against God, that's not a battle you will ever win. So how much wiser is it then for us to say, Lord, I am praying this prayer from the very bottom of my heart, but even as I pray it, I confess that you do have the right to say no if that's what you think is best. If you learn, if you learn that, you'll sleep better at night. If you learn to acknowledge that God has the right to say no to your prayer, you'll sleep better at night because he's in control, not you. And my third and final point then is this. Keep on doing what you know to be right. See, in the darkness of unanswered prayer, you might be tempted to give up on God, right? You may feel like just throwing in the towel and checking out of the Christian life. But what good is that going to do you? If you turn away from God in the times of trial, in the times of temptation, where are you going to go? Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on reading the Bible. Keep on obeying. Keep on following the Lord. Because if you stay the course in the darkness, eventually the light will shine again. And you will be glad that you did not turn away in the moment of your disappointment. When we finally get to heaven... 
we'll have a perspective we don't have now and we'll be able to look back over the pathway of our lives and see that through all the twists and turns and the seeming detours that God made no mistakes. We see as dimly now. We march on in the shadows of life. But the day will come where the sunlight of God's love surrounds us as we stand in the presence of Jesus who loves us and gave his life for us. But until then, we have to continue moving on forward, knowing that some of our prayers are not going to be answered as we wish, no matter how hard it is we pray. But this fact sustains us on our long journey home. God didn't say that my answers are sufficient. What God said was my grace is sufficient for you. Let's pray.